So I'm happy tonight to present and introduce Richard Webster, who's Riverkeepers representative on the Decommissioning Oversight Board, the DOB. Richard, do you wanna come on camera? So Richard Webster is an attorney with over 20 years of experience in environmental litigation, in addition to 10 years experience as an environmental consultant and expert. He has represented numerous environmental groups and municipalities on a wide variety of issues. He is also Riverkeeper's representative on New York's decommissioning oversight board that oversees the decommissioning of Indian Point. Until last year, Richard was the legal director for Riverkeeper and now serves as outside counsel. Before joining Riverkeeper, he litigated an aging management issue in the relicensing of the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant, an environmental justice issue in the Indian Point relicensing, and multiple issues in an initial licensing for the Levy nuclear power plant in Florida. Before becoming an attorney, Richard was an expert hydrologist and environmental scientist. Richard received his JD in 2002 from Columbia Law School. Long before that, he earned a master's degree from London University in engineering hydrology and a BA in physics and from Oxford University in England. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Richard. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Um, so very pleased to be here. The goal tonight is to <clears throat> kind of say a little bit of where we've come from on Indian Point and then say where we're going and then zoom in a little bit on the tritium issue. So Rebecca, can you, can you give me the next slide? So yep, keep going. Okay, so first of all, I wanna talk about why Riverkeeper uh, campaigned to close Indian Point. The, the genesis was cooling water discharges. We had a campaign called Power Plants That Suck. Um, Indian Point actually was supposed to be uh, what was called a closed cycle cooling plant, and then at the last minute, they switched it to a, what's called a once-through cooling plant. And so there are huge volumes of river water being sucked in. And along with those uh, huge volumes of water were large amounts of um, organisms, small fish, larvae, and so forth. And those were killed by, by going through the plant. Um, in addition, there was a, uh, a hot, thermally hot discharge that came into the river and disturbed the ecosystem. So that's where we started. Um, and then sort of on, on that core, we had concerns about radioactive contamination. Uh, there were groundwater discharges into the river. The groundwater had leaked from the fuel pools, both Indian Point 1 and Indian Point 2 fuel pools. And uh, there were also ongoing tritium discharges. So those are the water pollution concerns. But then we had as sort of the more we looked at Indian Point, the worse it got, really. Um, there was a risk of accident, high risk of accident. Uh, earthquakes were a problem, newly developed, newly discovered faults. Poor maintenance was a problem. There were problems with these things called O-rings that seal the reactor at the top. Uh, baffle bolts that kind of hold the reactor together. There was a packed spent fuel pool. The fuel had been packed in so tight that there was a danger of a fuel pool accident. And there was co-location of gas pipelines. Um, all of these things can give rise to an accident. Um, obviously, an accident at Indian Point is particularly severe because it's close to New York City. So in the, on the consequence side of the accident, uh, we had a, a huge population in the area. And then we had a failed evacuation plan. There was a study called the WIT study many years ago that really showed that the, the, the paper evacuation plan wouldn't work. And um, so we also actually, with, uh, with the Clearwater, I worked Clearwater on the evacuation plan. And we also showed that uh, there was an environmental justice issue because of course, generally uh, people who have less access to cars um, have a tr more trouble evacuating. And particularly when the evacuation relies on, you know, open air bus stops, where you're supposed to stand at the bus stop and wait for the magic evacuation bus to pick you up. And it, the worst case possible actually was the, uh, the Sing Sing prison where there was really no um, plan on how to get the prisoners out there, or at least no plan that was had anything close to working. So um, Indian Point, you know, pollution issues, 
were where we started, but then we got into all these accident issues and the consequences of accident issues. So we uh, campaigned for many years to close the plant. Next slide, Rebecca. So how did it happen? Well, basically the state, Riverkeeper and Energy agreed in January 2017 to close Indian Point in 2020, 2020 and 2021. I think that's units two and unit three, respectively. Why those three? Well, those are the parties that were in the proceedings at the NRC regarding license renewal and in the proceedings at the state regarding the cooling water discharges. Um, the agreement was a settlement, basically, of those proceedings. And so um, you needed all the parties to the settlement, uh, all the parties to the proceedings to agree a settlement. So that's why Riverkeeper was in there with the state and Entergy. Um, why did it happen? Well, I think we can say Entergy's decision was precipitated by various state actions and economic factors as well. So it was kind of a, everything came together at the right time. Um, gas was cheap, so the competition was strong. And uh, the state um, really worked hard in the in the um, the cooling water proceeding and uh, in a couple other proceedings to make relicensing difficult. Um, in particular, the state was uh, very active in the relicensing proceeding. And um, although I always say no one ever wins at the NRC, uh, the state managed to not lose for a long time. So that was a uh, put effective pressure. But why was the state trying to close Indian Point? Well, the answer is because of public pressure. Um, I strongly believe that the state would not have chosen to put such pressure on Indian Point had the state itself not been under pressure from groups like Riverkeeper, Clearwater, Ipsic, and many others. I mean, I, I won't name everybody, uh, but you know, it takes a village to do these things. And uh, there's a lot of support from all around Westchester County. Um, for the closure, and that really got the attention of the state. Um, <clears throat> further illustrating that the state didn't really have any ideological problem with nuclear plants, uh, the upstate nukes got bailouts at the same time as uh, Indian Point was closed. So I think it shows you that the public pressure uh, was dispositive in getting this plant to close. And, and Riverkeeper, we were, we were very pleased and happy to be part of the coalition of groups that. Uh, that precipitated the closure. Next slide. So with every success comes some problems, and this is no um, exception. Here, once the closure agreement was in place, we faced the problem that Entergy had the right under NRC rules to delay decommissioning until 60 years after closure under a program called Safe Store. Um, so that was the first problem. We really didn't want the plant, the, the 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 plant site, to be left in a contaminated state for 60 years. We wanted a we wanted a fast cleanup. The problem is, Entergy selected Holtec as its decommissioning specialist, and I think as we said at the time, Holtec has a track record of bribes, lies, and risk taking. So that wasn't good. Um, NRC, as I think most of you know, is captured by the industry and is not responsive at all to public pressure. So uh, the NRC basically nearly always rules for the industry and um, is actually impervious not only to public pressure, but it's pretty much impervious to political pressure because of the way it's funded, which is it's 90 percent funded uh, by the industry. And it's an independent federal agency, which means it doesn't directly um, answer to Congress. There are some oversight. Uh, committees uh, in the Senate, but uh, again, the senators on those oversight committees have generally pretty close ties with the nuclear industry. I always said that um, if the industry ran its reactors as well as they ran their lobbying campaigns, I would not be so worried. Um, there was no full-time NRC inspector on site, so during decommissioning, there is no full-time NRC inspector. And then the NRC citizen advisory boards are generally run by the licensee. They are largely serve as for uh, to, uh, to for the licensee to tell people how well things are going. Um, there's this issue called preemption, which is that state jurisdiction over nuclear plants is quite narrow. Um, the federal law specifically says that all nuclear safety, issue, safety issues are reserved 
uh, for the NRC. And a number of state laws have been uh, struck down on that basis, uh, in particular one in Vermont about relicensing re was struck down because legislators said repeatedly um, that it's about nuclear safety. And so if you say that and you pass some legislation, if it's about nuclear safety, it's preempted. It's that that's the federal government, the NRC's uh, exclusive jurisdiction. Um, and then finally, there were some issues. You know, there was a $15 million community fund. Of course, the question then came, who's going to get the $15 million community fund? Or, and to cut to the chase, eventually it was split between the towns, uh, Buchanan, um, Portland, and uh, and a project that Riverkeeper favoured, which was uh, long-term monitoring of the biological state of the river, which had been funded by Entergy while the plant was open and was facing uh, a lack of funding when the plant closed. Um, so we managed to get that issue resolved. Um, but I want to emphasize that Riverkeeper itself did not get a dime of the um, of the $15 million. Uh, in fact, during the settlement, uh, I believe we were offered some fees and we didn't take them because we didn't think that was the right thing to do. So um, if you hear rumors to the contrary, give me a call. I'll let you know the full details. Next slide. So those are the problems. So the, the, the question is, what about opportunities? How could we work the problems around into opportunities? So first of all, Holtec promised to get the decommissioning done in 15 years and to get the fuel out of the fuel out of the fuel pools very quickly. And for those that know anything about Indian Point or nuclear reactors in general, um, the reactor itself is the highest risk operation on the site. But the fuel pools are still a big risk. The, the, the chance of them um, having an accident is fairly low, but the consequence of them having an accident is extremely high. I mean, when I say extremely high, I did some calculations for Oyster Creek and discovered that basically a, reaction, a, a, a spent fuel pool fire at Oyster Creek would have contaminated about half of New Jersey. And that's contaminated for a long time, made it uninhabitable. So. The spent fuel pool fire is extremely um, consequential, and uh, Holtec was offering to get the fuel out of the pools very quickly. Um, we decided overall that we were not going to get any joy. We'd spent quite a lot. I've spent quite a bit of time uh, fighting at the NRC through adjudicatory proceedings and other other methods, and have had very little to show for it. Formally, sometimes you get some useful information that you can then feed forward into other. Uh, campaigns, but we decided instead of putting our at the our eggs in the NRC basket, we would largely put our eggs in the state basket. And so a coalition, including Riverkeeper, sought greater state oversight, basically through the DOB. Um, happily, our legislators at the time, Pete Harkham and uh, Sandy Galef, were very receptive to this idea and uh, proposed legislation to achieve a DOB. Um, the Public Service Commission asserted jurisdiction of the license transfer. Jurisdiction was not a given. Uh, we had to work on that for quite a while. And again, with the help of our legislators, uh, we got the, the Public Service Commission the legal right to assert jurisdiction, and then they did assert jurisdiction. Um, the PSC then convened a, a settlement process with all the parties um, in the PSC proceeding which included Riverkeeper, and uh, after many hours of uh, Zoom calls during the uh, pandemic, we managed to agree what's called the joint proposal, um, which basically sets out a number of very useful things that Holtec has to meet, and importantly, puts these things in the state jurisdiction rather than the federal jurisdiction. So the JP, I won't go through the whole thing, but it provides important financial guarantees. It provides DEC supervision of the cleanup. It provides for uh, some funding of emergency emergency management, emergency planning, et cetera. So the JP, um, you know, you can focus on what's not in it, but you have to realize that there's a lot of things that are in it. Uh, this is probably the best deal that anybody's had on decommissioning in the country. Um, and so 
I think it was a very important step and a very useful step. We wouldn't have agreed to that settlement unless we thought it was substantive and um, that it would provide us, put us in a better position than not having a settlement. And then the governor, actually what happened was that our legislators were pushing legislation, but the governor short-circuited the legislation by agreeing to set up the decommissioning oversight board, which is what we have. And I should say, again, the decommissioning oversight board, um, this is something that originated with a, a few other groups that we, we came on board and took it up with them. Um, it's pretty clearly the best oversight board in the country for decommissioning. And uh, I think so far it's played a useful role. We've actually achieved some, some useful things uh, on certain issues, uh, such as weight limits over the pipeline, for example. Um, and it's also served a very useful transparency um, function. And it, of course, it gives us a, a chance to hold Holtec's feet to the fire a little bit in front of uh, a public audience, which I think acts as, a, as good discipline for them. And then um, finally, DPS, the Department of Public Service, has provided a full-time state inspector uh, who is on site uh, to supervise the decommissioning. So overall, I think um, with decommissioning, we we had a lot of, there's a lot of issues. It's a tough, the NRC deliberately sets it up to be uh, tough to work on. And I think we did a pretty good job overall, although, of course, since I was involved, it's kind of, I shouldn't really say this, but but I think overall comparing with that, at least let me put it this way, other activists from other states asked me, how did, how did you guys get that? Because that's a really good deal. And the answer is we got it again through a broad coalition of public pressure, um, which, uh, which then made our legislators sit up and take notice that our legislators were responsive. And then because our legislators were responsive, Ultimately, the state was re responsive. So it's a, it's a chain coming from, from the bottom, uh, public pressure pushing upwards uh, through environmental groups to get to the state. Uh, Rebecca, next slide. Okay, so yeah. It's kind of, this is kind of the theme, I guess, of the, of the presentation. Two themes, I think. One is public pressure gets us somewhere. Two is you can't always get what you want. Uh, but... Can we get what we need is the question. So the gas pipeline remains much to the chagrin of many, um, but there are protocols in place, as I said, to prevent rupture due to, due to heavy equipment. There's a school on the edge of the site, but there is robust radiological monitoring in place and it will be augmented. Emergency response is in place until the spent fuel pools are empty. However, that's the good news, or the semi-good news, <coughs> The bad news is Holtec keeps pushing for exemptions. Holtec, I should recognize, isn't un unusual in this. They basically have a playbook that the NRC has provided that says, you know, when you get to this stage, apply for this exemption. When you get to that stage, apply for that exemption. And they're just basically going through and doing what the NRC told them to do. Uh, but nonetheless, it isn't good for us. The dry casks for spent fuel. So when the fuel comes out of the spent fuel pool, it goes into dry casks. Those dry casts are vulnerable to terrorist attack because they're currently exposed. You can see them from the river. And the aging management is inadequate. In other words, the inspections that they will do to make sure that there isn't any um, decay of the canisters inside the casks um, really are cursory. And I won't go into the details, but, but believe me, there's, there's a lot of work to do on that. We have radiate, radioactive groundwater continues to leak from the site. And then finally, we have what you've all been wondering when I'm going to get to, which is um, there are tritium discharges proposed in what's a business as usual approach. You know, the, the, uh, Entity was doing this before. Holtex has come along and said, okay, we'll just keep doing the same thing. So that's, that's where we were. Next slide, Rebecca. All right, so why did this tritium issue come up? And I think it came up and I could be wrong, but at least one factor was that citizen pressure um, in Massachusetts led the NRC to basically use the uh, the, the, the NIPDES permit, the Clean Water Act permit, 
to prevent discharge of tritium into the bay in Cape Cod uh, at Pilgrim. And that continues to be an ongoing debate there. But I think, you know, people saw, well, wait a minute. If, if, if they're afraid of tritium pollution in Cape Cod, we should be afraid of it here. Now, the slight difference is that Entergy had discharged this tritium, this radioactive water, for 50 years while the plant was operational. Um, and just so you know why it's only tritium, or basically only tritium, it's because the treatment plant that they have reduces the other radionuclides through a series of filters uh, to a very low level. So it's, it's nearly all tritium. Um, so I think that the Cape Cod scenario showed us that these discharges could be stopped with appropriate citizen pressure. And of course, that's not something we succeeded on for a long time. I mean, we, succeeded, we succeeded in closing the plant. So to that extent, we'd, we'd stopped ongoing tritium discharges, but we hadn't um, been able to stop uh, the, the discharges while the plant was operational. So the campaign to prevent tritium discharge was led by grassroots groups, and uh, we came on board with that campaign. And uh, it prompted us to, to evaluate the issue very carefully. We listened to everybody. And um, next slide, Rebecca, we'll see what we came up with. OK, so we basically listened to everybody. And and we'll, I'll tell you our position in a bit. But, but I just want to, before I do that, just uh, highlight what tritium is and why it's a problem in some ways and why why uh, it's it's kind of there's there's no very easy way to deal with it so tritium is basically water which you remember is h2o from your high school chemistry uh, but there's two extra neutrons in the nucleus of one of the hydrogen atoms right so what basically what that means is the electrons are the same but the neutron the the nucleus is different so chemically, it's exactly the same as water. You know, it, it behaves in the body just the same as water. Uh, it goes into the body, it'll be absorbed by the body, et cetera. The only way to separate it is by weight, because obviously with two neutrons, um, you've got a, a proton and two neutrons is, is, is a lot heavier than just, um, just one proton. So the, the weight difference is, is quite substantial. Um, the nucleus is unstable. This is what gives rise to the radioactivity. So when the nucleus splits apart, it emits an electron. And so it's called a beta emitter. And basically, beta just means beta particle is an electron. It just is a, it just is a, another word for it. Um, the half-life is about 12 years. So that means, what does that mean? That means that, you know, if you start with with an activity of 10 curies, then after 12 years, it'll be five curies. After another 12 years, it'll be two and a half curies, et cetera. You keep going down. Um, and it never quite, you know, just, just to be, just to emphasize the point, it goes down as an exponential curve. It asymptotically goes to zero, but it never actually hits zero. Um, if the tritium is in your body when it emits an electron, that can cause genetic damage. Obviously, you should avoid ingestion of tritium. While there is a, an EPA um, drinking water standard, that isn't based on health issues. So there is no good health-based standard. And I think there's a concern about bathers, bathers and organisms in the water. Uh, we haven't got evidence showing it's bad. Or we haven't got evidence showing it's harmful at the levels it will be discharged at. But likewise, the industry doesn't have levels saying it's not harmful. So we have an unknown here, and basically we're taking the precautionary approach and saying, let's be precautionary. If we can avoid this discharge, we should. Next slide, Rebecca. All right. Tritium, who regulates it? Well, the answer is NRC. Does the Clean Water Act regulate it? Answer, no. There's a Supreme Court case that says that. Uh, the NRC, as I've said, is not going to stop the discharge. Therefore, we need to mirror what we did before and go to the state. Um, the state 
could use a chemical that's in the spent fuel pool called boron. Uh, if it prevented that discharge from the spent fuel pool, then that would also prevent the tritium discharge. That is what EPA did at Cape Cod. Uh, I say they might be able to do it because there'd probably be some legal challenges if they did, uh, but that is a possibility. And then I think the best chance of <coughs> stopping this discharge is state legislation, which uh, Pete Harkerman and um, Dana Levenberg have happily proposed. And we're hoping, we're supporting that legislation. We're hoping it will get passed. Um, but just a word of warning, to avoid preemption, we have to be careful not to venture into nuclear safety, but stick to economic and health issues. So um, it's not, a, it, to, to be clear, it's not about preventing an accident. It's about um, economic issues. If people think there's tritium in the, in the Hudson, they may be less likely to uh, buy houses, use it for swimming, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is River Hughes' position. If we can avoid the tritium discharge, we should. There are two options which haven't been explored to any great extent yet, which is solidification and separation by weight. So we think the best approach will be to store the tanks, store the, the tritium war, tritiated water in tanks for 12 years while we evaluate the options. And why 12 years? Two reasons. One is because it's a half-life, so at minimum we know we'll have half the problem in 12 years. And the other is because that'll be just towards the end of the decommissioning, so it won't impede site reuse. We'd also like the groundwater discharges to be stopped. That, that groundwater is unfiltered. It came out of the fuel pool, I think Unit 2, mostly in Unit, unit 1 and Unit 2, and it, it contains heavier elements such as strontium and cobalt, and the strontium does bioaccumulate to your bones. So that's nasty stuff. We would like those discharges to be stopped. And then we'd like everybody to support the, the Harkham and Levenberg bill. We have to get quick action on this. Holtec said at the last DOB meeting they want to discharge in August, and they might even discharge before that. So um, we need to get this done quickly, and I think the, 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 um, the proposed bill is the best way of doing that. So I think that's it, Rebecca. Next slide. Yes. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Appreciate it.